Amen. You know, I thought about getting Andrea up here to play something on the piano and let me sing with her. But there's no way in the world I'll ever follow them. I don't have to wait till I get the glory. Wasn't that beautiful? Yeah, you saw them so pretty today. Amen. Blessing has been to be in God's house today. And, uh, and now we're going to feast on the word for a few minutes. Amen. I heard a phrase many, many years ago. I think it was a pastor who said, oh, I might have read it. But it said something like this. He said, you know what? I think we might be living or might be living today in the terminal generation. And then I heard another one recently that said, I know we're living in the terminal generation. What in the world are they talking about? I heard that. I never have forgotten it. And I heard it again recently. But what they're talking about is this, simply this. We might be part of that wonderful, special, privileged people chosen by God to be part of that group of people that's going to be part of the rapture of the church. Amen. And the reason I say that is it's wonderful and we would be privileged to do that, and we don't know when, don't know how soon it may be, but we just may be. But one of the reasons that I would say if, if that does happen and we would be privileged to be part of that is because of this. Simple, the simple fact is we'd be part of a generation that would never taste death. Amen. That's what the Bible says. That's right. Now, I know what you might be saying. You might be saying, well, wait a minute. The Bible says as a point of man wants to die. And it does say that, right? And uh, Job, the book of Job says that our days are appointed by God. Even our months are known by him, and we can't pass them back. That's a scripture in the book of Psalms that says as well, what man can escape the hand of the grave? He cannot do it. Everyone is going to die except a special generation that will be alive, part of the church, when the rapture of the church takes place. Amen. That's what the Bible says, doesn't it? In 1 Corinthians chapter 15, beginning in verse 51, it says this. Paul says, Behold, I show you a mystery. When he says mystery, in the New Testament sense, it means something that has not been revealed until right now. Behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep. The euphemism for death, right? Uh, when, a person, when you see sleep in the New Testament, it means about a person that's going on to be with the Lord. We shall not all sleep, but we all shall be changed. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trump, for the trumpet shall be sound, and the dead shall be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. Amen. Do you see that when it says in verse 51, Behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep. Not all sleep means there's going to be a generation that's not going to face or taste death, physical death. Now, I don't know about you, but I'd like to be part of that generation. Amen. Amen. It says the same thing in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. Look, if you would, at 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. It says, beginning verse 13, the Apostle Paul said, But I would not have you be ignorant or unknowing about this, brethren, concerning them which are asleep, those who have died in Jesus, that you sorrow not. Don't we? Don't, thank God, if you're a believer, if you're a child of God, and you know that person that died that's going on to be with Jesus, Yes, you're going to sorrow, you're going to grieve, it's going to hurt. It's very painful when we lose a loved one, right? But yet, the Bible says we don't have to grieve like those who have no hope. Because we know that if they died in Christ, and if we're believers, we're going to see them again in glory. Amen? We're going to be with them. We're going to be on that shore they sung about a few minutes ago. But he goes on to say that you saw are not even as others which have no hope. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so them also which sleep in Jesus, those who passed on in Jesus. You see, this group has some questions about their loved ones dying. Jesus had come, so they're wondering about them. He says, those who sleep in Jesus, will God bring with them? Where have they been? The Bible says, for the believer, the child of God, uh, the moment you die, this, you go into his presence. <laughs> to be absent from the body is to be what? Amen. Present with the Lord. That's quick. Amen. And they, that's, so that's where they've been. For this we say unto you by the word of the Lord, that we which are alive and remain. Now, notice that. You need to under, un, underline that if you would. Those of us who are alive and remain shall not precede, prevent, it says in King James, but it, says, it means precede, go before them which are asleep. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Amen. Do you see that in that passage? There's a group of people, that is a generation of people, there's a part of the church that's never going to face 
uh, physical death. Now, I would like to be part of that group. If God chooses that for me, he can do that. He could choose the same for you. But the point is, I believe we just may be living in that terminal generation. Why do I say that? I say it simply for, for, because of the fact that so many things that's happening around us that points to the soon coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. At, at the, when we're going to be caught up, when we're going to be snatched up, that's what the word means in First Thessalonians chapter 4. It can happen at any moment of time. As I said a few minutes ago, nothing else needs to ha be happening or scripturally to be fulfilled before Jesus comes back for the church. We believe in the imminent return of Christ. That means that at any time, at any time, this is Jesus can come for us. Amen. And I don't know about you, but I wouldn't mind it happening today. Amen. I would love to see him come today. And the church was always looking for Jesus to come. If you go back and you read the New Testament, and if you read anything about church history, you know that they were looking for Christ to come in their lifetime. As a matter of fact, they would greet one another with the words that you read in the New Testament. Maranatha. You've seen that, haven't you? You know what that means, Maranatha? It simply means, our Lord come. So they greeted one another with that, with that one word. And by doing that, they were saying to each other, Boy, I wish Jesus would come today. Our Lord, come today. It would be our to to come today. Now, why do I say that? Why should we have that hope? Why should we be excited about it? Why should we anticipate the coming of the Lord? Some might say, well, what does it matter to me about all these things about prophecy? What does it matter to me? What difference does it make in my life? It should make all the difference in the world in your life, in the way that you live. Uh, and as a matter of fact, the Bible says we ought to be looking for the Lord to come at any moment. We ought also not only to look for Him, we ought to long for His coming. We ought to long for just looking expectantly, excited about it, looking forward to His coming. And because of all that, we ought to live like He could come at any moment. But why should we look, why should we long for His coming? For the simple reason of this, what we saw here this morning. Sickness, sickness, disease, decay, death. All of that for the child of God is going to be behind them when Jesus comes. The Bible says that when he comes for us, the moment that he calls, sounds that trumpet, listen, at the moment the archangel sounds that trumpet and Jesus gives the command, that moment in time, we're going to be changed. We're going to be changed and we're going to be just like the glorious, resurrected Lord Jesus Christ. Isn't that what the Bible teaches? So we ought to have that longing. We ought to have that looking. We ought to be excited about, you know, about him coming. Because the Bible clearly indicates that we ought to be doing that. You know? The Bible says, if you would, look at Philippians chapter 3. I read this this week. This wasn't even part of my message, but I want to read it just because I thought about it. I feel like when that happened, the Holy Spirit gives it to me. Verse 20 of chapter 3 of the book of Philippians. Philippians. Some of these things come to me this morning as I was saying that, so I wrote them down. I said, I need to look at this. But then this happened today, and I get excited because knowing one day we're going to be out of here, and we're going home to be with Jesus. The Bible says in verse 20 of chapter 3 of the book of Philippians, you found your place? Yeah. Did you bring a copy of God's Word today? Amen. When you come to Blessed Hope Baptist Church, you need to bring your Bibles. Amen? Amen. That's the textbook we use here. Verse 20 says, Paul says, listen, our, for our conversation, which means our real citizenship, is in heaven. Mofat, one of the great translators of the Bible, says that we are the colony of heaven, living right there here upon earth. We are just pilgrims and strangers here. We're just traveling through. That doesn't mean to say that we're not citizens of the United States of America. We are, whatever country we are. We are, in, we are citizens of that country. We ought to be loyal to that. We ought to be submissive to the government, the powers that be, because they are ordained of God. But our real home, we're not there yet. Our real home is in heaven. Amen. That's what Paul here says. And I want you to see this morning before we get out of here. They were New Testament believers in Paul's day. And since they were, we ought to be the same way. Whenever they were talking about the coming of the Lord, and we're doing that, going through the book of Revelation, not quite half through yet, but we're going through that. And but when they whenever they would talk about the coming of the Lord, they would get excited about Jesus coming. They look forward to him. They anticipate, they were excited, longing for the coming of the Lord. You can see it here in this verse. He says, Our conversation is in heaven. From whence also we look for the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. You know what that means? It means to this. 
The word in the Greek is real strong. I have heard and I've understood this to, for them to say what it says from once we look for the Savior. It simply means it's a strong word, a hard word in Greek. It means simply something like this, that you would stretch forth your neck and your face and your eyes and, you, and you're looking for someone to come. <coughs> looking for, longing for them. It kind of like the father, the prodigal son, how portraying God, looking for his son to come home. Amen. He was looking, he was longing for his son to come back. Well, Paul here is saying simply this. We are, we are looking for him to come. We're excited about him coming. We're expecting him to come. And we're eager for him to come. Eager for him to come. Our conversation is heaven. For whence also we eagerly look for the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. Who shall, now look at this, who shall change our vile body. Amen. Think about that. What does it mean when he says that? Well, these old bodies, they're, they're human bodies. They're bodies of flesh. Bodies as we are today are physical bodies. That means that we're under the curse, amen, that happened in the Garden of Eden. And part of the curse is this thing called sin, and sin also causes decay, and it causes disease, it causes sickness. As long as we're under the curse, as long as we're living in these fleshly bodies, and until they are changed, until our bodies are redeemed, that happens with Jesus comes, Romans chapter 8, right? Yes. But until then, guess what that means? It means simply this. We're going to age. We're going to get old. We're going to get sick. And at some time in the future, unless we're part of this generation, I've been sharing with you back, we're going to pass. We're right. going to die. We're going to expire. Amen? But notice what it says here again. When he comes, and this is why we ought to be excited about this, brother. And this is for young people, too. I talk to young people all the time, and you know they'll say, uh, I don't know why I'm talking to you. <laughs> but anyway, you, you'll say to them, and get, you, try, you ought to be excited about the coming of the Lord. And they'll say, well, look, I'm young. I've got my whole future ahead of me. And especially if I'm engaged, I want that to happen right now. You know what I mean? But, but still, when you realize what's going to happen, what God is going to do for you when Jesus comes, you can get excited about it. Because he's going to change that vile body. That body that does get old, that does uh, experience disease and sickness and eventually death. He's going to change that, Paul says. Notice what he says. Who shall change our vile body that it may be fashioned, made like, unto his glorious body. Amen. A body just like the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, how talking about Jesus and the body that he's talking about here, folks, is the resurrected body of Jesus. You know, we're going to have a body like his one day. How was Jesus after he was resurrected from the grave? Well, it looked physical. In a sense, it was seemingly physical. but was different. It was a spiritual, physical body, if you will. He could still be recognized, right? He could still, still sit down with his uh, disciples and eat a meal with them. He could still say to them, look, it's me. Touch me. Feel me. So in a sense, it was a, a physical type of body that had physical characteristics and physical uh, you know, descriptions that like it was before he was resurrected from the dead, being he was recognizable, but it was different because he had a body that could just disappear, if you will. He had a body that could go through walls. Didn't he? Remember how he went when the disciples was behind locked doors and they were uh, scared to death and they were you know, thinking probably in their minds, boy, we're probably next, so let's lock the doors, let's... Let's pray. You know, they were in a, in a pit of despair at that time, but all of a sudden, guess who comes in and appears before them and says, Peace, spirit. It's Jesus. And he's in his glorious, resurrected body. And it's going to be, and we're going to have a body the same way one day. Because Paul says, We're going to have a body that's going to be fashioned just like his, according to the working whereby he is able even to subdue all things unto himself. Now that's why Paul and the early church, and why we should as well, be eagerly looking, expecting, longing for Jesus to come in our day. The Bible says in Titus chapter 2, notice you will turn back, this is where we get that name of our church from this, Titus chapter 2. <clears throat> Titus chapter 2, look at what it says in verse 13. We all know that by heart. Well, let's go ahead and start in verse 11. For the grace of God that brings salvation has appeared to all men, thank God, teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lust. Look at this. This is for the believer, for the child of God. We, we who know Christ, 
We who are in a relationship with God through a relationship with Jesus Christ. We who know Him. We who are adopted in His family. Look at what it says. Teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lust, we should live how? Soberly, righteously, godly in this present world. And verse 13 says, looking for that blessed hope. Do you see the excitement there? Do you see the, the, uh, the anticipation there? Do you see the enthusiasm there? Looking for it. And the reason I'm saying all that is because of this. A lot of people don't want to hear messages about the second coming of Christ. A lot of people don't want to hear messages from the book of Revelation. A lot of people don't want to hear messages about the rapture of the church. As a matter of fact, there are even some in pulpits today saying there's nothing, uh, no such teaching, no such doctrine found in the New Testament or in the Word of God about the rapture of the church. I beg you different, don't you? Amen. And so they'll, they'll say to their people, no, we don't preach on around here because it's not relevant for our time. It means nothing to me. It shouldn't mean anything for the church. It shouldn't mean anything for the individual believer. I can't see that, can you? I think we ought to get excited about it. They were... I believe it was Michelle is. She reminded me two or three times. And sometimes I need this because I get down sometimes. Amen. You ever get down sometimes? Amen. And you you have looked so long for the Lord to come and he still hasn't come. And if you're getting aged and I am saying, Lord, we're running out of time here. You know? But isn't it good to have a believer, a child of God to come along and say, Hey, Jesus is coming. Don't you understand? Jesus is coming. Our Lord is coming. I read she said it a half a dozen times. I'm looking for Jesus to come. Amen. And no real good po uh, positive me, I would say, yeah, but a whole lot of things got to you know, happen. You know how you get sometimes. But he is coming. And we ought to be excited about it. Paul was. The early church was. Notice what it says. Looking for that blessed hope. That wonderful hope. That happy hope. That's the only hope we've got, beloved. Amen. Do you see anything else you can offer us a, a, a hope in this world in which we are living today? I look all around me and I see gloom. I see despair. Like they used to sing on Hee Haw all the time. I'm not going to say that. I've done it before. But I see all these terrible things happening in our nation, in our country. I, we're looking at a bloodless coup, it looks like to me. And so many bad, I hear, I've heard one after another say it. We're living in dangerous times. We're living in scary times. There's no, no, no telling what's going to happen. I am telling you that the only hope for the child of God, and if you know Jesus, this is the blessed hope. And what is that blessed hope? Listen to what it says. The glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Now, if you trust Him and you know Him, and you're absolutely certain that you know Him, then you ought to have this, this longing. You ought to have this look, and you ought to be excited for it. Why? Because you're going to be with your Lord. That's the best part about going home, amen? Yes, listen, the added benefits of no more sickness, no more disease, no more decay. And thank God, no more sin, no more temptation, no more wickedness. That's going to all be behind us. But the greatest part of all is we're going to see our Savior. We're going to see Jesus, the one, listen, who gave himself for us. That he might redeem us from all iniquity and purify unto himself a peculiar, that means a, a special people, zealous of good works. And Paul says to Titus, these things speak and exhort and rebuke with all authority and let no man <coughs> despise thee or look down upon you because of your youth. You exhort the church, you encourage the church, you get them excited about the coming of the Lord because he is coming. Amen. And who is he coming for? He's coming for me. Amen. Because I put my faith in Jesus many, many years ago. Thank God the Spirit of God spoke to my heart one day and revealed to me that I was lost, that I was dying, that I was going to hell. And I would have busted hell wide open if I had continued to wait. But then I heard the gospel of Jesus Christ where the, back, where the brother shared with me and I forget exactly what it was, but I heard it all my life. But then one day, the Lord opened my heart up and gave me an understanding to know what, what it meant to be. Uh, you're a sinner. You're lost. You can't save yourself. But I got good news for you. God still loves you. Amen. And he sent his son, Jesus Christ, the Son of God. God, the Son himself, stepped out of heaven one day to take on a body of flesh and blood in order to die for you. 
He died for you. He became your substitute. Listen, your sin bearer. When he died upon the cross, he paid the price for your sins. Amen. And when he was buried and, and laid there in that grave, three days later, he was raised up. Yes. Glorious resurrected by the Lord to prove to the whole world in all history that God Almighty is satisfied Amen. with the work of his son, Jesus Christ, on the cross of Amen. And that is the only way. Listen, you'll be in heaven with him. That's right. Amen. Only way, my friend, don't you believe there's so many paths to heaven? Don't you believe there's many other ways? There's only one way to heaven. And Jesus himself said, I am the way, the truth, and the life, and no man cometh unto the Father but by me. But by me. The apostles preached that, didn't they? They preached that message that said, there's no other hope, no, one, no other way you can be saved, only through the blood of Jesus Christ. God did that just for you. And if you accepted Jesus, you received him as your Lord, as your Savior, you are ready. Yeah. Amen? But if you're not, you need to do it this morning. Amen? Amen. Let's stand up our heads by our eyes closed. <laughs> Father, now we just pray that you bless the reading, the study, the sharing of your word. Thank you so much for the services we've had here today, Lord. We know that you're here. We know that you visited with us today. And we praise you and thank you for that. Now, Lord, we give an invitation and appeal to those who are here. Some might be here that's never trusted Jesus and received him as Savior Lord. Some might be here today, Lord, that maybe they, they think so, they hope so, but they're not sure. Some might be here today that's never truly heard the gospel of Jesus Christ to understand. But, Lord, we share it this morning. And those who are here, those who are listening by uh, social media, those who are listening by radio, Spirit, Lord, I pray that if there's any listening like that and they still have not given their heart to Jesus, Holy Spirit, would you do your work upon them right now? Lord, show them their need. Convince them of that. Convict them of their sin. And then bring them to the Savior today. And what I was done, Lord, we'll praise you and thank you for all that you do for us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.